Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Outlaw Picks podcast. So we'll chat a little bit about the Jan Bojavic uh, card, which was a lot of fun, and we'll talk about the fights this this uh, upcoming weekend. Holly Holm against Ketlin Vieira. First of all, quick shout-out to our sponsors. So our good friends at Xbrain, xbrain.co.uk. You can use the code OUTLAW, and you'll get 20% off. That's the collagen that I use all the time. You've got your sleep optimizing, your, uh, your total brain optimizers. So whether you're sleeping, you're working, you're recovering, whatever you need. And this as well, these are amazing. Yeah, yeah, this really is good. the uh, the mushroom tincture set. Um, so with this, you'll get six different types of mushrooms that are all in their own little boxes. Each one of these has got a pipette like a dripper, and you can make your own concoctions with this. All the information is on the back as well as on the website. So depending on what you need, whether you're looking for recovery or focus or you know whether your your brain's a bit foggy and you need to clear your clear your head this is the thing to go and get so uh, go on to xbrain.co.uk use the code outlaw uh, outlaw with the without the ed and you'll get your 20% off all of this kind of stuff and our friends at uh, canacarts uk um so if you go on to canacarts.uk uh, you can place yourself an order you'll get one of these the lanyard uh, the 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 cartridge for it Absolutely fantastic CBD. This is all made out of uh, ceramic as well, so there's no plastic nastiness uh, leaching into the the good oil. Um, and if you use the code Outlaw CBD, you'll get five pounds off your first order, and it's free shipping in the UK. So make sure you do that. Canacarts.uk and give them a follow on Instagram as well. Why not? How you doing, Jamie? Yeah, all good, man. All good. So we are discussing um, Bojovic first. And that card. Was there anybody else that stood out to you on that card? Oh, yeah. I mean, Manuel Torres probably got one of the yeah. best knockouts I've seen this year. I felt bad for Frank Camacho. Yeah. He's just he's, he's always there to trade, isn't he? You yeah. know what I mean? And he just seemed a little bit too slow and not quite as lo- not quite as long long enough for uh, Torres. Like, didn't they come in at a similar height, but then Torres just looked so much longer? Yeah, it? it was strange. Like, when I was writing up the stats, they were exactly the same, like, height and reach, I think, as well, even. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Manuel Torres just seemed so much more longer in, in the striking range, like able to land. And yeah, the finish was wicked, like slip. Was it a straight and then left hook? Yeah. Yeah, wicked. Yeah. yeah, he's definitely one to keep an eye on. Definitely one to keep an eye on. Um, Chikagian and he was had a really good fight. Yeah. That was, a, that was a far more ferocious pace than I was expecting, yeah. to be honest. I thought it was going to be far more Chikagian on the back foot using her jab and just kind of like slowing Hebus down as she was moving forward. But fair play to Amanda. I mean, she she was there to make a point, wasn't she? Yeah, especially in that last round. She just kind of unloaded. Yeah. Um, Screaming maybe, at one another. Yeah, yeah. I think she was maybe trying to mimic Chukagan's like, Reminds me of like you know tennis players you know when they yeah. when they hit. Ah! yeah yeah ah! <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that would make sense. There's a lot of lot of female fighters that make loads of noise. In fact, Holly Holm this weekend yeah she's one of them. Um, Davy Grant looked really good. Mm-hmm. He yeah. was just a little bit too over enthusiastic in that first round, wasn't he? Because I mean, like, so he won. He landed what sixty six significant strikes in the first round. Came out in the second round and all of a sudden he was like, mm. oh God. And Smoker's just, he just takes so many big shots. Smoker yeah. does. Yeah. I, I was impressed with Davy Grant. I think he gets better each time we see him out there. And the fact that he's one of the fighters that's using this switch stance footwork, it just it just gives him an advantage that, that a lot of other fighters I don't think have. Um, good to see Michael Johnson get a win as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was good. But yeah, like you said about Davy Grant, it's a shame he's had a bit of like, because he wasn't fighting that regularly, was he? If mm. he was, I think he'd be a little bit further along yeah. in the division as well. Yeah, and I, and I think with a bit of um, with a bit more attention from the media, I think the fans will start to really like him as yeah. well. Because like as as he was walking out, I think I said to V, I'm like, he is literally one of the nicest guys you'll ever yeah. meet in the sport of mixed martial arts. And then as soon as the fight started, I think one of the commentators said the same thing. He is just. This, he's just a super nice guy. You just wouldn't think that he wants to get in there and punch somebody as hard as he does. Yeah, he's. Uh, I seen a podcast. I think Mystery shared it on his story, and he was talking about like how much he loved just training to be hard as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really like cool little uh, quote from him. Yeah, it was. He just tell he like loves it as well. It's great. Yeah. No, I like the guy. He's, yeah, I like the guy a lot. Um, Ryan Span impressed me as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he predicted it exactly as as it was gonna go as well i didn't listen to it back what did i say did i say pretty much the same as what what happened yeah pretty much he was gonna cinch it up and then drop and 
yeah, just, yeah, yeah, chase him to. It's just, I mean, you know, the thing is with Ryan Spann is it, that that's kind of his thing, and because because of this the 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 size and the style of Kutalaba, at some point he was going to end up close range with his head lower than Ryan Spann's armpit. It was just going to work yeah. out badly for him at some point, you know. Um, I think Ryan Spann's an interesting one. I'd like to see him. I'd like to see him, like gradually get build some consistency because I think, I think he's got some skills that there can be a real problem in this division. I just wonder whether, I mean, you know, he's ran into Anthony Smith and Johnny Walker, and they're the two that have kind of upset him in, in the UFC. But his wins have been impressive. You know, Serkinov Kutalaba's a, a good win. Finished Devon Clark. Stopped um, uh, uh, Rogerio Nagira as well. Little Nog. Yeah, he's. Um, I just don't know whether he's accelerated a bit too fast. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's he's gone up because I was just look, looking at the rankings now, and he's just gone above. He's number twelve now, above Johnny Walker. Okay, so maybe that's think, a rematch to happen. Yeah, mm. I'd like to see him against. Um, I don't know if Jamal Hill is probably looking a bit further up the division, but I think that would be a really good fight. Yeah, well, Jamal's uh, Jamal's just beaten um, Johnny Walker, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that would make sense because then if he if he got that fight against um against Jamal Hill and beats him, then it kind of it, it foregoes the need to beat Johnny Walker. Yeah. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. It's not I mean MMA math doesn't exactly work like that, but it, it would uh it would certainly make make his ranking above Johnny Walker in the rankings more sense, given mm -hmm. the fact that he's got a loss to, to Walker. But yeah, definitely someone to keep an eye on. Um what do you think to Rakic's knee? Yeah, it was weird, wasn't it? Because it did. You did see it pop mm. like out the side. I don't know. Yeah, I felt a bit bad for him really because it might be something that might put him out for a little bit as well. Yeah. And like he was, he was on a good like trajectory, and this was kind of a good opportunity to make his yeah. well put his stamp on the division really. But yeah, just unlucky really, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I I wonder whether it was. I wonder whether it was the. The the damage that Jan had done to his lead leg, which was which had made him like drop his weight awkwardly onto his back leg, or whether Jan's low kick defense might have done it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like like uh, Rakic threw a lot of kicks and Jan was bouncing them off his shin bone. I don't know whether that may have may have affected his knee slightly. Yeah, unfortunate though. Good to see Jan get another win. But yeah, I, I still he's still in a very awkward position in this in this division. I think if Tashira beats Prashka, then that that opens the door up for Jan, but. I don't know. I kind of felt like Rakic, Rakic was going to beat Jan, and then Prashka is going to beat Tashira, yeah, and that's yeah. going to kind of bring in the new wave of light heavyweights. You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of how it felt like it was going to work. But maybe the old guys are going to hang on for a little bit longer. Who knows? Well, I could see now maybe Rakic. Well, depending on on like his recovery time, like him and Ankalaev, maybe having the fight for the for the next yeah title yeah shot yeah that'd be good yeah yeah yeah. What about Jan? Who do you want to see him fight next? Well, it's hard. I mean, really, like, being his ex-champion, like, you'd think he would get... you think he would get the rematch with yeah, the winner the of the next yeah. one? Yeah. I mean, he could. He, he, he could, absolutely. Especially because there's nobody really, like, like champion at the bit at, like, heavyweight to, to get a title shot. Let me have a quick look. I've got the rankings pulled up here. This computer's been incredibly slow today. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's still some guys floating around like Anthony Smith and Thiago Santos and Dom Reyes. Like, there's still a few guys that are that that you know. Let's see what Paul Craig does next. He's got a Uzdemir next, doesn't he? Paul Craig. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Craig against Uzdemir, eight against nine. Yeah, it's it's a like I said last week. It's a bit of a weird division because it, there's kind of no like besides like the top top four or whatever there's no really like Anthony Smith's already kind of been to the top and yeah um like yeah. Ankalaev is the one to be keeping an eye on because I, I feel like he's the one that's that's next in line for a title shot in everybody's mind especially if Rakic is going to be out for a while so you, it's because you've, you've got the champion at the top Glover Teixeira then Jan right underneath him and then Prohoshka who's fighting Teixeira so that could all switch very quickly Jan's held his position at number one Rakic is sitting at number three but then if he's out for six months dealing with a knee injury, then that might move him down the rankings and move a couple of people above him. Mm -hmm. Ankalaev is most likely going to be one of those people that moves up above him. And the winner of Paul Craig Uzdemir puts himself in a really interesting position as well. 
Yeah, because that because if well if Paul Craig wins, that'll put him on a pretty decent streak yeah. as well, right? Yeah, especially if he subs him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially if he triangles him. I'd still like to see Paul Craig and that Anthony Smith. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's an interesting mm-hmm. one. Just because I think you know Anthony Smith has got the ground game to to force Paul Craig to strike a little bit more. I mean Uzdemir might as well, but we've seen Uzdemir struggle on the ground with guys in the past. You know, I could see Paul Craig being able to to beat Uzdemir on the floor, whereas Anthony Smith, I think, is a more competitive one. Yeah, mm. yeah, it was a good card, man. It was a good card. There were a few. Uh, yeah, I thought a few um, sleepers further down as well. Petrovsky yeah. looked strong. Yeah, that that surprised me. To be fair, yeah, mm. I thought he he looked really good. It's just a squeezy pot on, like I. I don't. I think Maximov in in that in most situations in that same in that same position he would have felt like he was going to be able to survive for at least another thirty seconds, but he was asleep fast, yeah, really yeah. quick, really quick. Well, I've seen Petrovsky like training before that fight, like climbing up like two ropes. Oh, was he in yeah. like the gym? And yeah, he looked super super strong. Yeah. Yeah, or well, shall we move on to the uh, this weekend's card? Yeah, sure. Okay, right. So we'll have a quick quick look at the at the, uh, the 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 prelims, but then we'll move on to the main card. So we've got a few good fights lower down this one. So we've got six prelims, uh, starting according to Tapology with Elise Reed against Sam Hughes. Um, now I was I was impressed with Elise Reed against Corey McKenna. Yeah, uh, I I didn't think that, that she was going to be able to to beat Corey McKenna just because. You know, McKenna impresses me every time she's out. Um, uh, Reed was coming off a loss to Sajara Eubanks. I kind of felt like Corey McKenna was going to be able to do the same thing to her, and, and she just she just wasn't. And, and then you know, Sam Hughes, she's was she coming off a win, isn't she against yeah. Estela Nunes? Yeah, like is it? I don't know. I mean, it's quite an evenly matched fight. I think this one is. I, I don't really have a good read on either of them. I think I think Sam Hughes is tough, but I think. Given what I saw from Elise in her last fight, I feel like she's got the advantage in this one. Yeah, I think so as well. And the way she was using that like sidekick against Corey to kind of keep that distance away. Yeah. And Sam Hughes is very like forward pressure, like trying to put it on her. Yeah. She is very square and very kind of yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. Tough, but I think she'll get caught. And that that overhand right Elise was using on McKenna as well as she was coming in. Mm. She might be able to catch her with that. It's like a really powerful shot as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Sam Hughes is actually the taller one of the two. She's two inches taller and she's got a one inch reach advantage. All the stats are off on this, of course, though, because Elise has not had many fights in the UFC. Yeah. 41% takedown offense for Sam Hughes, 25% takedown accuracy. I, th- I think she might she might want to try and grapple in this one a little bit, to be honest, mm. especially if she's able to get around that sidekick. But yeah, I think I think Elise Reed is one to keep an eye on. I think I just underestimated her coming in against Corey McKenna because I I know Corey's good, really good. But yeah, five and one now going into this one. I think I think Elise Reed takes that one. Don't you? Yeah, I've got Elise on that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chase Hooper against Felipe Colares. Now Chase is a he's 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 almost there, isn't he? Yeah. I just feel like he could do with like. He could do with being being put back in the oven for another couple of years. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? He's just like he's he's six foot one and uh, twenty two years old. He's just he's he just doesn't have that kind of physicality that I feel like he needs in this division. Like there's some monsters at featherweight, some guys that are really physically capable, and Calaris doesn't really move backwards. You know, I mean, he's you know, uh, was it was it Gutierrez he fought in his last fight? Yeah, just really constantly, put it on him. Yeah, yeah, really put it on him, constantly moving forward. Comfortable switching stances as well and was hammering kicks in. I feel like he's going to be physically the more imposing of the two. I, I, I mean, I, I think once I think if it hits the floor, of course, Chase is, you know, that's where his skills show through. But I could quite easily see him getting just kind of, just kind of walked down and beaten up a little bit, bullied a bit. Yeah. See, uh, when the, um, was it David Taymor Chase fought? Mm. Yeah, that was in his like, yeah, that was in his mm. debut. And I thought every time I've seen Chase, he, there is that element of like he doesn't look as physical or as strong, but he's got that kind of wiry, he's just got the length that he yeah. can just like wrap people up. And the Tamor um, finish was really good. Like went like the way he transitions from like back to like top position to top mount, and then he was like laying the ground and pounding. I thought he looked, he didn't look 
um, like he didn't look like he lacked strength. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But I, th- I think if he's able to get in the range where he can use his technique, his lack of strength does it doesn't show through quite as much. But I think I think whenever he's put in a bad position, then yeah. his then his opponent physically looks far more far more dominant. I mean, you know, against Peterson, he was able to he was able to put him in bad positions. He was able to threaten him with things, but Peterson is just his toughness, his durability. I mean, uh, Peterson coming into that one was what eighteen and nine, just like loads of experience. You know, he was a he was a tough individual. He wasn't going to go away. I feel like he's got the same kind of problem with Kalaris, and I don't know whether the UFC is trying to test him to see whether he's ready or not mm. for this level. But I mean, Kalaris, he may just walk him down and get wrapped up, as you said, and get subbed. But he he may also be able to bully Chase Hooper. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, because I've not seen Chase since, because he last fought almost a year ago now. Yeah, it is, yeah. So he might have put on a bit of size maybe in the gym or just built, built up his strength a little bit. Potentially. I mean, he's only, what is he, 22? Yeah. 22. I mean, he, you know, he's in the next few years, he's going to, if he keep, keeps training and he doesn't get discouraged, he'll grow into a quite a quite a, a dangerous individual, I think. But at, it just at the moment, he just looks like he's... He just looks like you just shove him over. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. These, I mean, what's so Calaris is what five years older than him, um, but he is shorter. He has got a shorter reach as well. So I mean, that you know, the the benefit here is that Calaris has got to get close to him to hit him, which suits Chase Hooper if he wants to get his hands on him, which is the most likely thing to do. So ten two and one for Chase, ten and three for Calaris. 6-1 for Chase Hooper, 5-8 for Kalaris. So a decent height advantage, as well as a 5-inch in reach as well. And in, and Chase being southpaw might just be problematic for him as well. But he's, I mean, he's, his takedown stat's not wonderful. You know, 18% accuracy, but then 2.2 a submission average per 15 minutes. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I, I want to pick Chase because I, because I can see them building him into... You know, in, yeah. into a you know a, a real prospect. I just don't know. I, I just can't count Calaris uh, Calaris out. The way he fought his last fight, the way he just walked Gutierrez down. I mean, it was a split decision. Yeah, it was those those like body kicks as well that he was yeah. throwing, like really powerful. If he catches Chase with a couple of them, he might right. be able to just cripple him. Even if he's kicking him on the arms and stuff. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. Which way are you going on that one? I picked Chase. Did you? Yeah, yeah I yeah. feel like he might. I can just might see him get a sub him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll go Chase. We'll go Chase on that one. But I just, I, I want, I want him to get to that stage where he, where he, he looks like he's not going to be bullied anymore. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like one, he, he reminds me a little bit of Wonder Boy in his like kind of, he's like in his mannerisms and stuff. He's very kind of like. He's very kind. He's he's not like a he's not a brute like like Wonder yeah, Boy's yeah. not a brute, but you wouldn't feel like you could bully Wonder Boy. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Whereas I just feel like Chase is he could do with like a couple more years, like three more years of developing, not to get not to get rushed too much. You know, keep him down the bottom on the prelims, or even just I mean, if he loses this one, I'd maybe think about releasing him. It's a shame that the UFC don't have a good partnership with another organization where they can kind of pass guys down to. Yeah, yeah. Because they've always got this, you know, everyone moves up from Cage Warriors or from LFA or wherever else. But there's not an organization where the UFC can go, okay, you need like three fights, go to this organization and they'll match you accordingly and then we'll sign you if you pick up three wins. Like they just kind of, this is why like, like they sometimes keep fighters longer than they should because they don't want to release him, because then Chase signs to Bellator, and he's the name that UFC wanted, and yeah, then yeah. he gets smashed by a couple of other guys. I, I, like, if they could develop a relationship with Cage Warriors that works both ways, or, like, LFA would be a good one, or whoever, CFFC is the other one that's that's on Fight Pass all the time. Like, they could go, okay, go and get two fights. Go and take six months or 12 months and get a bit of experience and grow a little bit, age a little bit, and then we'll sign you back when you probably when you're more ready. That'd be a smart thing to do. Yeah. And I think Chase is one of those guys. I mean, they could have done the same to to Sean O'Malley, but he was such a, a crowd draw that, um, yeah. Was it like you know the contender series? Mm. Obviously, that's over, only over a certain amount, and they only probably have like one, maybe two fights before they get into the UFC. Maybe if they just use that as like a season long thing, and they just put a pool of fighters in there, and then whoever comes out on top afterwards. 
the next season they go into. Yeah. That'd like be ideal. Obviously. Yeah, that'd be ideal. Because then they get like four, or f- maybe like three or four fights against like good competitors that are coming up as well, you know. Yeah. But guys that are not ready to kind of make a run. Yeah, for the they top can 15. kind of grow together almost. Mm. But then the best just make their way in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah interestingly, these two, so Chase and Calaris are ranked on the topology ranking system, which, uh, which includes everybody. They're ranked 84 and 85. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Although Calaris is ranked at bantamweight. So is he moving up for, for this fight? That might swing things a little bit in. Uh... Yeah, he is. His last one was at bantamweight. Ah, right. Okay. Although, no, he beat Luke Sanders at featherweight. So I guess he might be just a bit between. So lost to Montel Jackson at bantamweight. Beat Domingo Pilate at, at uh, bantamweight. So he's had a couple of featherweight fights. He fought Geraldo De Freitas at featherweight in his debut as well. Okay, so maybe he's returning to. He's had a, he had a bunch of featherweight fights in his uh, before he joined the UFC. Then he fought De Freitas at featherweight and lost. Then he went down uh, to bantamweight and beat Pilate by split decision. Stayed at bantamweight and lost to Montel Jackson. Went back up to featherweight, and beat Luke Sanders, and then went back down to bantamweight to fight Chris Gutierrez. Yeah, he might have that power though. Yeah, that because he did look. I mean, even against Sanders, he looked quite big, and that yeah. was at featherweight. Yeah, Sanders is probably really short though, isn't he? Sanders? Yeah, like yeah. really compact, short. Yeah, he yeah. reminds me of Rorschach off um, Watchmen. Oh, oh yeah. Watch yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what actor he plays in, but it's Luke Sanders looks just <laughs> yeah, like him. Yeah. I mean, that might change things a bit. Maybe taking out some of that weight cut because he, you know, if he's if he's losing decisions at bantam weight, it might be because he's you know he's not physically able to keep up a pace at that. But against against Chase Super at featherweight, he might be able to. We'll go Chase. Yeah, we'll go Chase. chase. We'll, we'll 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 keep our prelim pick as uh, as Chase, but. Yeah, it could be a rough one for him, I think. Okay, this one's going to steal the show. Yeah. Jonathan Martinez against Vince Morales. There's no doubt this one's not going to steal the show. Like, Morales is is a is a, an absolute warmonger. You know, I love his fights. And Jonathan Martinez is a lunatic. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we've established this on the show. The, ki- the kid's a bit of a, a, bit of a psychopath. Um, which way are you going in this one? I picked Vince. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. I think I don't because I, I know both of them are just gonna want to throw down, mm. and I think if it, if it is just that kind of fight, I think Vince has just got the slight power advantage yeah. on him, and if he catches him, I think he's more likely to knock him out. Yeah, yeah. Davy Grant caught Martinez good, didn't he? Yeah, with that yeah. switch hook. Yeah, I think v- Vince is a little bit. I mean, he's a bit. Well, he's four years younger. He's a bit wiser. He's been in the UFC a little bit longer. He's got a bit more of a. He manages his pace a bit better, manages his range a bit better. Like he's quite happy to move in and strike and then move out again. Whereas Martinez, he's a bit okay. Let's fight. yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I, th- I think Morales might be able to might be able to have more success landing in this one. And Martinez might catch him on the way in, but I also think he's going to take those shots in in the process. So fifteen and four for Martinez, eleven and five for Morales. Uh, Martinez has got a one inch height advantage, but they've both got. A 70 inch reach southpaw v orthodox both got a really high striking output as well 4.58 compared and uh, 4.62 not huge striking accuracy on uh on vince morales's part but again like this is where their stats and are affected by their setup shots because morales will throw a shot to cover his distance as he's moving in whereas martinez walks himself into range which is why most of his shots land yeah um yeah, I mean, 73% takedown defense for Martinez. Yeah, I can't really... See, unless Martinez hurts Morales, I could maybe see him shooting for a takedown, but I yeah. think it's... I can really just see it either a knockout. Just a kickboxing this one. match yeah, this yeah, one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bit split, to be honest. I, I, I just... I think this is going to be a fight of the night. It wouldn't surprise me if they both get knocked down and, they, they you know, we get a round piece going into the third... Mm-hmm. It could quite easily be a fight like that. I'm I'm kind of seeing Martinez winning the first round. I think he might come out uh, aggressive and enthusiastic and try and put it on him early. Like keep you know keep a high pace, stay aggressive. 
but then Morales will kind of start to pull it back towards yeah. the end of the fight. Better quality shots, maybe not the volume. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think Vince gonna, might take this one. Yeah, Morales. Okay, okay, right. Um, And another Morales. Omar Morales against Euros Medic. So Omar Morales is moving back up to lightweight. Right, okay. So he, was, he, he made his debut when he came into the UFC, he made his debut as a lightweight. I think he's been a lightweight all the way through his career. But he was undefeated coming into the UFC. Um, came off a a, a first minute uh, head kick knockout on Bellator, and then uh, fought in the contender series. Won a second round stoppage on that one over um, Harvey Park, and then made his debut against Dong Hyung Ma um, at lightweight. And he won his next one against Gabriel Benitez as well, as well. And then went down a weight class, right? Yeah. Then he went down and got Giga Chikadze in his in his <laughs> next fight. That's like, a tough fight, even at lightweight, right? Yeah, and he, and it's not like he was not like he had much weight to lose either. I, I'm not really sure what his thought process was in that. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether featherweight's that much of an easier weight class than lightweight. I think weight, I think lightweight's a deeper division. I think there are more guys at lightweight that are difficult to get around, but I think the guys at the top of featherweight are just as dangerous as the ones at lightweight these days. Yeah, and like you said, he's, he's. I mean, he's not really got much to lose either, so he's probably cutting or he's like getting rid of muscle maybe to make that weight he must have done he must have done um picked up a win after that against uh shane young and then went on to lose against jonathan pierce so he's one and two as a featherweight and that last one was a submission loss maybe that's the reason he's just kind of thought i'll try it it didn't work out i mean he's you know he's still undefeated as a lightweight and uh i think this is a i think this is a very winnable fight for him I think Medic is is good, but he's a very very quick starter. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that you know, if you look at uh, Morales's record, uh, sorry, if you look at um, yeah, Omar Morales's record, like he can work to a decision. You know, he can he can win points and fight to a decision. Whereas Medic, I don't know whether I don't know whether he might start to come unravelled a little bit if it starts to go deeper. I mean, he's been into the second round a couple of times. I don't know just once into the second round, but that was a. 51 seconds of the second yeah. round. Yeah, it's all all of his fight. I mean, his last fight against Jalen, he got a little bit overwhelmed, didn't he? I know mm. that was the first round for Jalen, but he, um, yeah, he, he's got a little overwhelmed in the strike and then yeah. when, when it went to the ground. I mean, I mean Jalen Turn is really good anyway. I'm pretty high on him. Yeah. but um, And he's awkward given his reach and his height as yeah, well. That's yeah. something that, um, that he's not going to get from Omar Morales. Let me have a quick look at the stats, see where we're at. I just I was surprised when Morales went down. I just thought to myself, this this is going to take away from his performance because he's going to have to, like you said, he's going to have to lose some muscle mass. He's going to have to really cut hard to make featherweight. So I'm actually glad. I mean, he's five eleven, so uh, eleven two for Morales, seven and one for Medic, uh, five eleven for Morales and six two for Medic. So it's a couple of inches in uh, in height for Medic, a couple of inches in reach for Morales though, seventy three inches. Um, ridiculously high striking output from uh, for Medic, but of course you know he's he's not been around for very long, yeah. so uh, that that stats way off. Um, decent takedown accuracy from uh, Omar Morales. I'm not sure how many takedowns he's actually attempted in the UFC, but his accuracy is 100. percent I mean, it might be an option for him to, you know, to to come in and and, and just, like take it to Medic and take him down and control him. Yeah, I think he. I think Omar's got to be pretty patient because, like you said, judging by Medici's, his quick starter, mm. and I feel like if Omar rushes in too early, he might be able to snatch a, a triangle or something. Yeah. Um, but I think if he kind of, if he makes the fight his own pace and just keeps Medici off and just wears him down, I think he'd be able to. Yeah. Yeah, beat him to a decision. Yeah, yeah, and I think he'll be able to take his take his shots better. I think Morales will be able to take Medici's shots better in upper weight class. Yeah, yeah. Like if this was if this was Morales as a featherweight, I'm not seeing him winning the fight. But j given the fact that he's able to go back up to 155, I think he's going to be physically able to take those shots better. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I'm taking Morales by decision in this one. I think he might be able to drag Medici into the later rounds. Yeah, I got Morales. Have you, yeah. yeah, I think, it, like I said, if he if he makes the fight his at uh, his pace, 
and just slowly not maybe not overwhelming but just slowly like wear on him over mm. the distance yeah 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 i mean you you know you look you look down the guys that um that Medis just fought you look at their records and i mean he, he's not fought guys with loads of experience you know a lot of the guys that he's fought have had like sort of three four five fights yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, he's a very explosive kid, but I just, I think Morales back at one fifty five is the is the place where he needs mm -hmm. to be. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Parker Porter against Jailton Almeida, Jailtown. <laughs> uh, I mean, judging off Jailton's last fight, I just think he'll be like way too powerful and yeah. quick for <laughs> Parker Porter. It's gonna be a, a fast takedown straight yeah. away. Yeah, That's, yeah. I mean, you know, if you're Porter, you want this one. You want this one on the feet, don't you? You want to keep this one standing, and and you want to try and try and outbox him and stuff his takedowns. The challenge is going to be avoiding getting taken down, and and you know, it, even though it's obvious what Almeida wants to do in his fights, he's still able to do it. Yeah, it's like being you know? able to prevent that, even though you know it's coming. It's yeah. like prevent it. It's another thing. Yeah. I mean, on the, on, the, on his contender series, he was he was shooting pretty much off the bell. He did the same thing against Daniel Marquez, walked out, and immediate level change. I expect the same thing from him in this one. I, I don't know whether Parker Porter is gonna gonna have uh, much success in defending his takedowns, but if he's able to defend a couple, keep it on the feet, that's when he starts to starts to bring it into his range. Um, I mean, height and reach advantage for Almeida as well is going to make it difficult mm -hmm. for him on the feet. But, you know, Parker Porter's a, a six-foot heavyweight. You know, he's, he's used to fighting guys that are... Uh, he's used to fighting guys that are bigger and taller and longer yeah. than him, you know? I just f feel if if Jelton gets that first takedown, I find it hard to for Parker Porter to get back up after it. Yeah. I think he's going to struggle getting back to his feet if he gets taken down. And I can just see him... See Jelton just like landing bombs like from yeah. top position. The other thing with this one as well is Jelton's going up to heavyweight to fight him. Yeah, because I thought he was a light heavyweight on his yeah. first fight, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, Dinla Lamarquez was light heavyweight um against um Nasruddin on um contender series, it was a light heavyweight as well. But it's not like he's undersized. I mean, no. you know, he's got the height and reach advantage. Three inches in height, four inches in reach. Yeah, I think you're. I think he's. I think he's going to take him down and and dominate him. To be honest, I think I think Parker Porter's gonna. He's going to look out of his depth here. You, know, you go down Parker Porter's record, and you know he's he's been. I mean, he got stopped by Daukus. That was really really slick striking by Daukus. But you go further down, and and he's got an arm triangle loss, and you know. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think Jelton's going to have too much for him. I think that's going to be a. A submission or maybe a TKO finish from ground yeah, pound. I think so. Yeah. Okay. 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 Where are we? Where are we? So uh, Joseph Holmes against Alan Amadovsky. Now this. So Amadovsky. He came into the UFC on short notice, if I remember correctly, um, and he fought uh, Jocko in his debut, which of course is an incredibly difficult fight to to take, especially in your in your debut, and he had. All kinds of travel issues as well, if I remember right, because he made his debut in Fight Island. So when he was coming in, he got stuck at the airport, and he had, he had he had to start his weight cut at the airport. Oh shit! I remember that being a being a topic when he when he was coming into fight week is that he's not like it's never ideal. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was the thing. Is it's, it's the situation is never ideal for him. Like he's not he's not won a fight in the UFC yet, has he? He's, no, uh, I mean, well, he came in undefeated, didn't he, off yeah. Bellator? Yeah, and stopping guys as well, you know, first and second round stoppages. But then lost a unanimous decision to Jocko and then got stopped by uh, by John Phillips at 14 seconds. I mean, that's John Phillips for you. Though, yeah. He's got ridiculous power in his hands. And then he's had a bunch of cancelled fights. Uh, Bevan Lewis and Hu Yao Zong twice. And now he's got Joseph Holmes. Let's have a quick look at the stats on this one. Oh, so he's had like uh, quite a while out as well, like 18 mm. months or so. Since that John Phillips fight, yeah, that's not ideal. That, especially if you're coming off a loss, that kind of haunts you for, for the time that you're away. So 
six foot four compared to five ten uh, for Joseph Holmes, and he's got an eighty inch reach. So he's got a six inch reach advantage as well. Like Am- Amadowski, he looks to me like a welterweight. You know what I mean? He yeah. looks like he's in the wrong weight class, and I think Joseph Holmes is going to make it look like that as well. Yeah, I think so. I think he's just going to be like way too big for him. And because he, Joseph Holmes' first fight was against uh, Jamie Pickett, mm. I think he's got like equally length uh, reach, like yeah. 80, 80 inch reach. Yeah. So I feel like now he can use that reach advantage to his advantage in this fight. It'll, yeah, he'll just be able to like keep him at distance, pick him off, maybe get a finish even. Yeah. I think he's, I think his striking is going to be overwhelming. Yeah. I think it is. And, you know, you look down his record as well and it's, you know, it, it he's he's beating people up until they turn and give their back and then he's choking them out. It wouldn't surprise me if if we get a, if we get a first round rear naked choke here. Yeah. You know, I I, I could see him because, uh, you know, amadovsky has been out for a while. You know, he's got that. He'll have those, you know, those jitters from being out for so long. Plus he's coming off two losses, you know, and he was an undefeated fighter coming into the UFC. So this is not playing out the way that he expected it to. And then Joseph Holmes is going to look massive by comparison. I think he's just going to. I think he's going to be on the end of his strikes until he tries to rush in and close distance, and then we might see uh, Joseph Holmes take his back in the scramble and choke him out. Yeah, I think I think Rennie could choke from Joseph Holmes in this one. Yeah, I got Joseph Holmes as well. Yeah, yeah, way too big for him. It's a massive, massive reach <laughs> yeah. and height, isn't it? That six foot four compared to five ten and a six inch reach advantage. Jeez. Okay, main card time. Right, so we've got five fights on the main card. So we're starting off with Eric Anders against Jun Yong Park, the Iron Turtle. It's a great nickname, that is. So I think this could be a bit of a banger as well, like maybe potentially fight of the night. Yeah. If it doesn't finish too early. Because I can see, because both of them like to swing, but I think Eric Anders is a little bit more calculated with his power. Mm-hmm. Whereas like Jung Sun Park, his last fight against was Gregory Rodriguez. Yeah, he's a little bit wild. Just both it? swinging, and it was like whoever lands first, I guess. Yeah, but, he, uh, he did show some improvements with his uh, with his ground game though. Against was it uh, John Phillips? Ah, right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think against Barry and John Phillips, we we saw some we saw some grappling from him, but definitely against John Phillips, I was surprised how much grappling he used. I think he was working a lot on his judo, and he was just holding top position and working ground and pound. Like I could see him doing that here. I think it's gonna be difficult to get Eric Anders down initially because I think he's a he's a big physical athlete, and Anders is one of those guys that drifts between two weight classes. Yeah, which I always find kind of weird because when he's at light heavyweight, he looks like a light heavyweight, but then when he comes down to middleweight, I'm like, how is he making this weight class? It's like just the this part goes yeah the middle section because <laughs> he doesn't check like he's he's got a massive frame. It's just his stomach goes down, just shrinks in a yeah. little bit. But yeah, I, I, I watched in Eric Anders against, uh, who was it against? He's had a couple against Darren Stewart recently, hasn't he? Mon- yeah. Oh, he lost, he lost to Moniz in his last one by armbar, didn't he? Yeah, like the Mershot fight. Slick oh, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he was, he was good in the wrestling exchanges. Like his takedown defense was really good. So I feel like if he can avoid that from Jung as well and keep it on the feet, I think he might be able to... Yeah, like win those um, striking exchanges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I mean you know Park's a lot of fun to watch, but he is he is he is hittable and he is a little bit reckless. And and I think Eric Anders, you know, he's a, he's a he's a he's a much more physical athlete than Jun Yong Park, which means you know re- regardless of where he takes the fight, I think he's going to be have the physical advantage, grapp- grappling or striking. And if Park decides he wants to grapple. He's gonna to have to invest a lot of time and energy and and be consistent and not get discouraged if he doesn't get the first takedown because you know I do think, I mean I I underestimate Park. He's I always do because he's a he's a very unassuming guy. You know, yeah. you, like he he makes makes fun of his own voice in his post fight interviews and stuff. He's a really interesting really interesting dude, but I I don't I don't know whether he's I don't know whether. If he has a rough first round, I don't know whether he starts to kind of come unraveled a little right. bit. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think if 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 you're going to beat Eric Anders, you need to be you need to be confident that you're going to get a takedown, regardless of how many you fail to begin with. 
And I don't know whether we're going to see that from Jun Yong Park. I could see him trying a couple of takedowns and hitting this like wall of muscle and being like, oh no, this is, now I've got to stand and trade with him. And then the unraveling goes into like a reckless, well, let's just hope I land first. Yeah, you know, I, I, th I feel like that's what happened in the Gregory Rodriguez fight as well. It's like he found out that he could no way beat him on the ground. So he just resorted to swinging, yeah. <laughs> seeing if yeah. he lands. Yeah. I could definitely see that, that the fight playing out the same way. Yeah. Did I go through stats? Uh, no, no, no. So 14 and 6 with one no contest for Eric Anders, 13 and 5 for Jun Yong Park, 6-1, um, so a, a, a decent height advantage and a two-inch reach advantage for Eric Anders as well. And, you know, this is the weight class for him at 185. If you can make it, do. Um relatively even uh, as far as um as far as striking accuracy and, and defense goes but the striking output of Jun Yong Park is higher but then that that's probably down to that John Phillips fight where he took him down and was able to throw mm -hmm. a lot of shots on the ground um 2.6 uh is average takedowns for Jun Yong Park compared to 1.4 for Eric Anders but Anders has a 74% takedown defense yeah compared to Park who's 47 yeah I think this is a win for Anders, to be honest, but I, I I I can't underestimate Park. I just I question his enthusiasm if he starts losing the fight. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like you said against Rodriguez, when he realised he wasn't going to be able to beat him on the floor, it was like caution to the wind, and let's just hope something lands. Yeah, uh, I like Junction Park's like hunger as well, like because he was when we were at Fight Island. Uh, I think he was one of the guys to call out Hamza as well, like early yeah. stages of Hamza. Yeah. And yeah, he wanted to <laughs> to fight him. And I don't know how that'd go now, obviously, but um I don't think you call him out now. No, nah, no, nah, true. <laughs> but yeah, I, I got Eric in this one. Yeah. I think he's just I think if he, if he can negate that takedown, I think he's just got the power and the striking ability to probably get get the finish, maybe. Yeah. 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 I I wonder if I wonder if he stayed consistently in one weight class and made it his focus whether he'd start to get some momentum. So I think moving up and down, it, it always it keeps the fight the the fans kind of confused as to what what's going yeah, yeah. on, you know. Yeah. Like where do you belong? Um, yeah. Okay, next one up, uh, Pollyanna Viana against Tabitha Ricci. Now, Ricci reminds me. And we mentioned this before because I I couldn't remember her name. She reminds me of Lupita Godinez, mm. who fought Carnalosi a, a couple of weeks ago. She just doesn't seem to have the same wrestling level that uh, that, that Godinez has, and I, and I think that she would need it against Viana. Like uh, Viana's ground game is is slick. You know, yeah. she's I mean, what she's coming off two armbar wins. Yeah, I two think first she's finished rounders. Every one of her fights as well. Yeah. What every one of her victories. Yeah, all submissions aside from a couple of uh, a couple of TKOs. I mean, I, I think this is a fight for Viana to win, to be honest. I, I think she picks up another submission here. I think Richie's, I think Richie's, she's got potential, but she comes in undersized against almost everybody. I mean, five foot one, you know, she's always looked very, very small. And she's just, she doesn't have that Lupita Godinez wrestling to, to back up her, her stature. And even if she did take Viana down, I still think that won't work out too well for her. Yeah, I because... Was Tabitha's debut? It was against Firo, wasn't it? And I think she was. Yeah, she, she got came the in. Shit beaten out of her. Yeah, was that short notice. That that one? was short notice because she stepped in at flyweight. Yeah, that's so she it. was like super undersized, like just looked really small against Firo. Yeah. Um, but then in the next fight, she came back in at straw weight, and she did look. She looked a lot better, like a lot more comfortable at that weight. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can I can just see her. Shooting in on Viana and Viana getting a submission of some sort. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's going to be an armbar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I I, just, I don't know. I don't, I mean the thing is, so she came in on that on that fight um, against um, uh, Menon Firo on short notice, but she was. She, I mean, she had a decent record up to that point. She's she'd been doing a lot of uh, custom rules stuff. I was just having a look at her record earlier. So she's got. She had, I think she was four and zero as a MMA fighter coming into. Um, the the Manon Ferro fight maybe five and zero, oh. but then she's got a bunch of like custom rules, um, custom rules fights as well, which I don't know exactly what those custom rules would be. Were they in Brazil? It looks like no, they look like, look like they were in Japan. She was ah, fighting, I, and, uh, I mean the referee was Yuji uh, Yuji Shimada, 
So it was pro- almost definitely in Japan. I don't know whether that was some kind of like... The event was called Seiza. Seiza. And it was on an open map. Yeah, I wonder whether the it was... The poster's really weird as well. Yeah. I wonder if it was some kind of grappling event. Because it does... I mean, it doesn't look like it was a... It doesn't look like there was any striking involved. Yeah. It looks like Tarantino stylized poster. Yeah. For fighting. <laughs> But so she's got experience. It's just not all MMA experience. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just think she's, I just think she's outmatched here. I really do. She's got quite good. Uh, is she a black belt, Tabitha Ritchie? Is she? Is she got good grappling? I'm not sure. To be honest, we'll have a look. Um, but there's grappling. There's grappling. I mean, you know, like Viana's won. Was she like a 14 time Jiu Jitsu yeah, yeah. champion yeah. or something? That, I, I just I don't know whether see the thing is in order to nullify her jujitsu she would have to have decent wrestling she would have to have um um Lupita Cadena style wrestling yeah, and, yeah. and she she just doesn't she's got wrestling you know she you know she does score takedowns but it's not the same uh, it's not the same level as what she'd need and her jujitsu is not going to be the same level as uh, as. No, I'm not finding anything. I don't know, to be honest. Yeah, it's just because in a um, topology photo, she's in the gi. Yeah. I assume if <laughs> normally they should have a good background if a topology photo is like that. Maybe she's just punking us. <laughs> oh, she's got her own website. So what does it say here? I wonder why her nickname is Baby Shark. Yeah, she fights out of Paragon Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. Let's see you. I wonder who else is on our team if we recognise anybody. I mean Paragon have been around for a while. They must have a few few fighters on the car on their uh, roster. Oh yeah, I've got Bill Cooper. Bill the Grill Cooper. My goodness, he's not fought for a long while. So he was on the grappling scene back when I was right. training at uh, Tenth Planet back in the day. Boom, Bill Cooper was a good grappler, really good. So Yeah, it's because there's always like that thing because I think in Tabitha's in both of her fights she's not really had I mean against uh, Olivieri she did she just kind of held her down it's like good good ground and pound yeah but I don't know if she's had the opportunity really to show her jiu-jitsu yeah so there might be yeah there might be you know there might be something that we've not not seen in a game I I just think the level at which she's going to be going to be competing. I mean, you know, like like you said, she was able to take down uh, Maria Oliveira and she was able to to work ground and pound. But she, I feel like I feel like if you put Viana in that same fight against Oliveira, she'd have subbed her in the first yeah. round. You know what I mean? I I just I think Viana is going to sub her here. Yeah, I've got Viana for the win. Yeah, yeah submission. First round armbar. <laughs> yeah, three in a row. <laughs> It makes sense. It makes sense. Has anyone ever done that? Three arm bars in a row? Oh, I bet they have. I bet they have. The fighter that, that um, uh, Ricky Hatton mentioned the other day when we were when we were over there training was Paul Sass. And Paul Sass used to fight out of Liverpool. Um, and he was known for his triangle. And it was like the Sass angle, <laughs> as, he, as he called it. But he was, I mean, he would literally, he would catch everybody with it. And they knew it was coming as well. So here we are. Check this out. I've just pulled up his Wikipedia page. So, I mean, his last fight was 2013. So he's been retired a little while now. But he went 7-0 and with seven triangles. Jeez. Six in the first round, one in the second round. Then he won his next fight by heel hook. Then he fought Rob Sinclair, who's a good fighter. Split decision on that one. Then he went another heel hook. Then back to triangle, then inverted heel hook against Michael Johnson, then a triangle armbar against Volkman. Then he lost two fights. He lost to uh, Matt Weeman and uh, Danny Castillo, and then he won one on uh, on Bellator by toehold. But like, I mean, you like you look at that, and it's not like he was fighting fighting nobodies in those first uh, six fights as well. Like his, so his fourth fight was Martin Stapleton. And his fifth fight is Andrew Fisher, who's one of the coaches oh, for yeah. Emma. So he got you know, a win last week. Yeah, he did. He yeah. looked good as well. Yeah, like he's not. He, you know, he, like these guys knew what he was going to do. They would. They were fully prepared to defend his triangle and still couldn't. 
Yeah. yeah. It's like that inevitable trying to stop it, but you can't. You can't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's in, that's incredibly impressive, that is. The first seven fights by triangle. Only one in the second round. Amazing. Yeah, I, th- I think we're going for... Uh, I think we're, we're going to see an armbar against... Uh, uh, yeah. From from Viana. Okay, now this is a. Th- I think this is going to be a really short fight. This, <laughs> but Chidi Njikwani against Dusko Todorovic. Yeah, I think that's a really tough fight for Dusko. I do really yeah. tough, especially because he likes to use his head movement to avoid shots, and Njikwani is lethal. Yeah, lethal. I think it's a really good time for. Chidi to come into the UFC as well because he's already got like bags of experience, isn't he? And he seems to be at that point in his career now where because he's because before he came in, was he on like a three fight losing streak? <laughs> and then since he's been in the UFC, he just seems to have like found his rhythm. Yeah, so he so he was on Bellator, um, and he lost. Yeah, he lost three fights in Bellator. He he did win a couple, but he lost. Oh, yes. um, he lost to Kor- uh, um, Korshikov by ground and pound. Uh, he lost to Salter by rear naked choke, and then he lost to um, uh, Kovayo by decision. But then he came off that uh, knee to the body on LFA before he went on the Contender Series. Like, he's got good wins on his record as well. I mean, you know, he's beat Andre Fiallo, he's beat yeah. Melvin Gallard. Max Griffin. Max Griffin. These are these are good wins on his record. I I I, I feel like... I feel like Dushko went all the way through because he had a good amateur career as well, didn't he? he was undefeated as an amateur, like 11, 11 fights or something as an amateur. Um, I feel like Dushko came in with, I've got a great ground game, so you're not going to try and grapple with me and I'm just going to strike. And then he played that game with everybody. And then he started to come undone a little bit for him. I mean, he got caught by by uh, Soriano a few times, and he mm-hmm. got um, that that was he got dropped a couple of times pretty bad in that one. And then he came in against Rodriguez and just couldn't deal with his range and with his striking. Like, of course, he looked good against Maki Patolo, but I felt like that kind of allowed him to return back to what he was originally yeah, very yeah. good at. Mm-hmm. But I I don't know if he's going to be able to get close to Njikwani here. I feel like Njikwani is going to be able to stuff his takedowns if if he does go for them because they are a bit sloppy. And I feel like he's very, very hittable. Yeah. The thing is with uh, Chidi as well, I watched one of his um, was it CFC fights and he's catching people with guillotines as well. Like, I feel like if Chidi's like getting the better of him on the feet and Dusko shoots, he could always catch him in, in yeah. something like that even. But yeah. Especially if he's hitting with a couple of good shots as well. Yeah. Like caught him with a couple of knees in the clinch because that's, I mean, that's another, another range that he's really d- dangerous at. Yeah, I, th- I think this is, like you said, going to be a short, short fight. Yeah. And uh, Chidi's, Chidi's probably going to get a finish here. Yeah. Let me just have a quick look at the tail of the tape, the stats. So 21-7 and seven with one no contest for Njikwani, uh 11-2 and two for Todorovic. Two-inch uh, height advantage for Chidi and a six-inch reach advantage. Yeah, that's going to be ridiculous. Oh, it's Todorovic's birthday tomorrow. Oh, is it? How yeah. old is he? Uh, 94, so he'll be 27. Seven, yeah. 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 And Njikwani's, uh, well, he's six years younger than me. Well, I just, I think his experience as well, like, yeah, he's been pro since like 2007 as well. Chidi. Yeah. Like, he's got a lot of experience and like I was saying, I think it's a really good time for him to come into the UFC. Like, is it his like peak? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was. I mean, there was a there were there were a lot of people aware of him because of his brother. His brother Anthony Njikwani was in the UFC a, a, um, a few years ago. It was also a, a lethal striker. Um, but yeah, Ch- like Chidi seems to be a much more well-rounded individual, and and f- the size of the size of him for this weight class as well, height and reach at middleweight, like six three and eighty inch reach. He's not going to be undersized against anybody in this weight class. He's got the striking skills to compare with the top guys in the division already. It depends on you know, on on you know, whether anyone can challenge his ground game. Like seventy eight percent takedown defense. Of course, that's limited to the few fights that he's had. But then, uh, Todorovic is on nine percent takedown accuracy. So 
going to be very difficult for him to get close to him and get him taken down. And I think if he does close Chidi down, I think then he's in he's in mm-hmm. uh, tight clinch range. Yeah, yeah. And that's when he gets clinched and need, and then he level changes into a guillotine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got Njikwani in, in that one as well. Yeah, same. Yeah, I think as well, like, because he's experienced lo- losses at this point in his career as well, I think that kind of takes away, like someone like Dusko who came in, came in undefeated, never experienced that loss or, you know, yeah. and Chidi's gone through that and he's experienced it, so he's a bit more, Yeah, it just takes that element of fear away a little bit I think for sure yeah yeah and just goes dealing with picking up those first losses in the UFC yeah. as well which is you know even more difficult it's much easier to pick up a loss and deal with it you know on your drive home from cage warriors yeah and be like, God, I'm annoyed about that but then this is worldwide and everyone's paying attention to it mm-hmm. and, and I think you're right Chidi's arriving at the right time you know seven losses on his record but a massive amount of experience in martial arts as well like he's he's gonna be fully prepared to 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 put it on Dusko, and he's gonna make make the most of Dusko trying to use his head movement to get away from from shots. And you got to think as well. I mean, we've talked about uh, Mark Andre Barrio before. Like he's um he's one of those like the benchmark tests in the yeah. division, like a Mershaw or someone like that. Sixteen seconds, mm-hmm. sixteen seconds, and he knew that shot was gonna land. The way he walked himself into range, he's like, yeah, okay, bang. <laughs> Yeah, it's a slickness of striking that you don't see very often in the UFC, and it's good that he's in middleweight as well because obviously we've got Adesanya up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the one I'm, I've, I'm keeping my eye on still is Andre Muniz though. He's the middleweight that I'm most interested in because yeah. he's the one out of all of them that I feel could just go the entire opposite way and sub everybody. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's a striker now, you know. Everybody wants striking and take down defense, but then you've got this guy that climbs up your back and steals your arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an interesting one. But Chidi is like, as far as the middleweight division goes right now, he is perfect for this division. Mm-hmm. And I think I think he picks up a win here over Todorovic. And I think he moves on to a to a, a, a higher ranked opponent after that. I feel like there's a lot of exciting fights for Izzy, potentially in the middleweight as well. Like guys like Chidi and Muniz, but also Alex Pereira's. I think he's fighting on the Izzy card. Oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah, I think he's Coco main event. Okay. Um, so that's a storyline within that as well, obviously. Mm. Yeah, I think middleweight's looking pretty exciting at the minute. Yeah. Some good guys coming up. I wonder if we'd see um, um, Andre, um, a Pereira against uh, Njikwani. Oh, yeah, that would be, be a good yeah. fight. That'd be, that'd be one for, um, for Adesanya to sit on the sidelines and watch. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. I wonder whether he'd rather fight someone like that or whether he'd rather... You look, say you look at say uh, Robert Whittaker, who's a striker with good grappling, or you look at Marvin Vittori, who's a grappler with decent striking. I wonder if Izzy finds it easier to fight one of those guys who's got more of a like a like a spread out skill set mm. than someone that's really good at one thing like he's good at. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, yeah. That's why I'd love to see the Pereira fight again. Yeah, Izzy in small and... gloves. Yeah, <laughs> the power of Pereira as well. And the yeah. size of him as well, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's a he's a he's a physically is a huge dude. Like when he fought um, Artem Vakitov in K one, and Vakitov was the light heavyweight champ, he was the one that looked smaller. Yeah, yeah, it's a good division to be a to be a, a middleweight striker at the moment. I'm just having a quick look at the rankings now. Um, who else have we got? I mean, you you know, you're looking for a path through the top fifteen for. Njikwani and you know you're looking at people like Shabazian and Brad Tavares and I mean Uriah Hall would be a great fight I, I'd, I'd love to watch him fight Darren Till Sean Strickland I'd like to see him fight yeah, Sean yeah. Strickland especially because I feel like he could wrap his foot around Strickland's head and that'd be fun to watch <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah lots of good fights for him lots of good fights for him we'll see how he deals with the with the grappling of, of Todorovic because he It'd be foolish for him to try and stand and trade with Njikwani, and I think he might know that. Yeah. We might see a more driven grappling game from him, which would be probably be a good thing. So yeah. are we both going with Chidi on that one? Yeah, I got Chidi in that one, yeah. Chidi, Chidi, bang, bang. Okay, co-main event. Santiago Ponzinibbio against Michel Pereira. 
I think this this could potentially be fight of the night as well. Yeah. M- not so much just just because I think it would be a crazy fight. Like the pace of Ponzinibbio. I mean, I feel like he has like slipped off a little bit just in terms of his like his pace and his output. We had all that time off, didn't we? Yeah, he's like that life threatening. Yeah. Uh, illness he had, or yeah, uh, I can't remember what it was. Some kind of infection. Um, but yeah, since he's come back, I mean, there was glimpses of it in the Miguel Beza fight. It's just like that forward pressure, just constant wearing people down. But I feel like someone who's like as busy but in a different way like Pereira I think he might yeah it's going to be a fun fight for mm. sure but I feel like Pereira might be able to do what he did against um the Fiaho fight okay like push him away keep him away and then just yeah. maybe do that over the distance yeah yeah I mean I, I could see that now I prefer this smarter version of, of Pereira and I think he's a more difficult person to deal with for his opponents the thing with Ponzinibbio is that he's he's made a career off having a really, really good one-two. Like, he's got a very, very quick jab, and he's he's got very, very straight punches, and, and he and he uses the full length of his arm as well. I mean, when you know, whenever you see him throwing a jab, you see fully extended out. My thought is in this one, he might just be able to kind of keep Pereira up against the fence and keep touching him, bang, bang, bang. Just keep pressuring him, and any time Pereira starts to kind of build into something where he's going to, like, leap or jump, you're just going to see... Um, uh, Santiago just keep jabbing him on the nose and he tends to pu- punch up as well he tends to be quite low and ramp his body up so I, I, I could see him I mean he's going to be susceptible for flying knees that's my concern for him because he does he is kind of low he does kind of leave his leave his chin hanging low but I feel like he's got the technical skills to, to mm. nullify Pereira in this one like I like watching Pereira because he's a bit of a wild card, but I would much rather watch someone that's got really, really good basics. Um, and in the Baser fight, we did see it. I mean, of course, Jeff Neal, we didn't, but that was a split decision. Jeff Neal is is a you know a highly respected welterweight. I I I feel like I feel like Ponzinibbio might have Pereira's number here. Yeah, I I, I did watch the um, Ponzinibbio Magni fight as well, mm-hmm. and like the way he. He just stalked him all the way along the the cage for the pretty much the whole fight until he yeah. got the finish. I feel like if if he can just like close that distance and take away the length yeah. of Pereira, he might be able to do that. Like if I'm Ponzinibbio going in there against Pereira, my intention is to be uncomfortably close to him all the time, because someone like Pereira needs the explosion and the wildness to you know to create power. I would want to be smothering that as much as possible and keep hitting him with the jab so he feels like he's trapped up against the fence and if he's going to do something, it's going to be something big, flying, explosive so I can either see it and get out of the way or just smother it straight away before he even starts. Um, like like Pereira is similar in some ways to um, Johnny Walker. Yeah. Like when people see him move, they give him space because he is explosive. And because they've seen him land, you know, wild stuff like that, that knee landed on Danny Roberts. Like I could see him landing that quite easily on Ponzinibbio. If Ponzinibbio is smart, though, as soon as he sees him move, he just moves straight into it and smothers it mm-hmm. and stops him gaining that momentum. And that takes some confidence, which I know that we we get from Ponzinibbio. But it's uh, we've got we've got to see a performance like the Magnify, really. We, yeah. We've got to see him do that. Otherwise, he's going to be. I could see that flying knee catching him on the chin. The one thing I really liked in Pereira's last fight as well against Fialo was that like f- uh, teep, that f- yeah. uh, front kick was just keeping that. And it was just like every time he was pushing forward, just keeping him back. Yeah. If he could do that, I feel like that would be really useful against Ponzinibbio with yeah. his his style of like pushing forward. Mm-hmm. And Fialo must be a similar kind of height and reach to, um, to Ponzinibbio as well, yeah. right? Must be a very similar... Let's have a quick look at the stats. Um, I still call bullshit on Ponzinibbio being on uh, Pereira being in his twenties. Oh mate, there's no he's, way. He's two years younger than me. No chance. <laughs> there's no way. There's no... Guy looks like my uncle or right? something. Yeah, it's crazy. He looks like a. He looks like an extra out of a get out <laughs> like a gang movie. It's, you know what I mean? Like some old school mafia bosses. Yeah, it's like that kid at school that's like. Brought in to play for the football team, like three years older. <laughs> yeah, like, nah. yeah, yeah. 
He's the ringer on the baseball team that's <laughs> yeah. smoking a cigarette and like, hang on a minute, you're supposed to be nine. <laughs> um, so 29 and five for Ponzinibbio, 27, 11 and two no contests for Pereira. Um, one inch uh, reach advantage for Pereira, but the, the, sorry, one inch height advantage, but the reach is the same. Um, very similar striking output. Both of them have got a, a high striking output, 4.7. Um, takedown offense is 100% for Michel Pereira. I don't expect Ponza Nibio to really want to grapple with him too much, but it might be worth him clinching him just to tie him up against the fence, but not not worth grappling with him on the floor. Hmm. I'm I'm going to go Ponza Nibio on this one. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. I'm I'm going to because there was a point when Ponza Nibio everyone was like, okay, he's going to be a champion soon. And then he then he just had all kinds of issues, didn't he? I mean, he was like he was lined up to fight um, uh, Kamara Usman back in 2018 before he beat Magny, and he was pulled out of that one due to a hand injury. Then he was due to fight Robbie Lawler, and he was pulled out of that one as well. Then he was due to fight Muslim Salikov, and that was Salikov who withdrew. He's had some bad luck recently. Yeah, it's sad because those two years out, like he was at that peak, and then the age I suppose that the those two years like adds two years to your age as well For and sure. if you've if you've had issues with like illness and stuff it's yeah I mean they weren't a healthy two years no like, exactly. he was on his deathbed at one point mm. he's 35 now compared to um Michelle Pereira who's what is he 28 <laughs> bullshit 19. there's no way <laughs> there's no way 28 there is no way he was born in 96 I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. I wouldn't need to see a birth certificate <laughs> yeah. to believe that, and I still might question it. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Um, Ponza Nibio on this one. Okay. Yeah, I think Ponza, Ponza Nibio is gonna gonna just walk him down for 15 minutes and jab his face off, and Pereira is gonna look rather stifled. I'm, I'm going for Pereira. Oh yeah. Yeah. I just, if he can keep that distance, then maybe get something explosive like a flying knee or something yeah yeah i can see that i think it's going to be a really fun fight though yeah yeah that flying knee is gonna be a problem mm -hmm. it really is just just because of the way that uh that ponza nibio stands he's he's a, you know what i mean mm. he kind of leans over it's good for him good for him to utilize his long range punches but bad at the same time for uh flying knees jeez that fee i was fighting again soon Andre Fiat was fighting Jake Matthews on 275. Oh, is he? Staying busy, isn't he? Jeez, yeah. Two first round finishes, that's why. Yeah, I think I guess because Fiat was really good, like in his last two fights, looked really good. Mm. And Pereira got managed to stay in there and kind of negate what he had to offer. So, yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going opposite ways on that one then. All right. Main event, Holly Holm against Ketlin Vieira. So Holly Holm, of course, former champion. Ketlin Vieira is most definitely on her way up to the belt. Um, the question around this one for me is whether Holly Holm's like, smart and wise and experienced enough to not allow Ketlin Vieira to get this win over her. I can see Vera, Vera winning fights against almost everybody in this division. But I feel like someone like a Holly Holm has got the the skills and the experience to be, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Basically what she did against Irene Aldana, yeah. like moved away, side kicker, move away, side kicker, jabber, make loads of noise. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and just never let her get, get very close. Like the, the only other way I see it going is if Holly decides that she wants to, um, if she wants to grapple with Ketlin Vera and hold her up against the fence, kind of like what she did against um, uh, Raquel Pennington. I, I don't know. I think Ketlin Vera, if this fight went on forever and there was no rules or time limits or anything, I think Ketlin Vera gets to her eventually. But I think over 25 minutes, this is what Holly Holm does. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. I think Holly's going to be smart enough to not stay in the range that Ketlin wants her to be in. Yeah. And just if she can avoid that and pick her off, because Ketlin's, she's quite like marching down, like she's quite tucked up. She doesn't, She's not very explosive. So if, yeah. if Holly's just in and out, like picking her off, and she can do that, like you said, over 25 minutes, I could just see it going like that. Yeah. Unless Ketlin just like rushes her and and get, gets her to the ground, like the 
Zingano fight. Mm. Um, I mean, she has got good grappling, Vera. Yeah. She, she has got a good grappling. But then she's also been nullified on the ground against Konitskaya. So I, I wouldn't put it past Holly Holm to be able to do that to her. I just don't think it'd be a very good use of energy for her. I think the smart thing for, for Holm to do, Southpaw the Orthodox, move away from her, keep her on the end of that sidekick, and then try and walk her onto the head kick that she got to, was it Betch Coher? She knocked her yeah. out of that. I, I could see her work in that. But then... I feel like Ketlin Vera is going to have better footwork than Aldana did. Like Aldana did not want to at any point step across and cut her off and walk onto that high kick. So she just, she never was able to control her. She always basically chased her in circles around yeah. the cage, didn't she? And, 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 I, and I, that was, that worked perfectly for home because she's not going to step outside of herself. She's not going to take any risks that she don't need to take. Like, why would she? And, you know, at this point in her career, she's each, each individual fight, I mean, it's the same for everybody, but even more so, I think, when you're when you're at Holly Holmes' stage, when you've already been the champion. Um, she's 40 years old now. You know what I mean? She's she's not fighting consistently either. I mean, her last fight was Irene Aldana. Like that, like a, a couple of years has passed since then, almost. That mm-hmm. was that was October um, October of 2020. She's not going to take any risks here. No. If if uh, Holly's smart, she's a smart fighter. She's a she's a veteran and a and a champion. I think she's going to play this one very, very cautiously. And I think she's going to try and nullify Vera over a decision and keep herself in line for a, for a shot at the title. You know, especially now everything's shifted at the top of the division with Peña winning the belt. You could quite easily see Holly Holmes stepping back yeah, in yeah, there and sure. fighting her. I think she is like, despite, you know, the stage she's at in the career, she's 100% looking to get back to that like title shot contention. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think she's just too smart. Unless Ketlin like is as smart and like really cuts cuts her off and like really closes that distance and really puts her puts it on her, but yeah, like you said, I just think Holly's just too smart and wily to not get caught in that trap. Yeah, and this this is five rounds as well, which doesn't it doesn't necessarily suit Ketlin Vieira. I mean, she's not had uh, not had many five rounders aside from that win that she's coming off over Misha Tate. Um. I think that was her first five rounder. With, with you know, by compared by comparison, Holly Holm is almost always five round fights, mm. and she's winning decisions over five rounds as well. I I think I think to beat Holly Holm, you've got to be you've got to be aggressive at closing distance, and you've got to hit her and hurt her. And I think there are very very few fighters that can do that. I mean, and Nunes being one of the few, like even Durandamy wasn't able to really get to her and hurt her as as such. Mm. You know, she was she was able to manage that distance against one of the best strikers in in the in the sport. I I, I feel like Ketlin Vera is going to be very very susceptible for that side kick. Yeah, side kick to the midsection, side kick to the lead leg. She's going to be frustrated. She's going to be trying to cut her off, trying to walk her down, and then Holmes is going to throw that high kick, and then she's going to run that way, and then Vera is going to circle back and try and cut her down. She's going to get hit with a side kick, then she's going to chase her down, then get hit with a head kick, and. I could see that happening. Yeah. And then as soon as Vera rushes in to try and close distance, Holmes going to grab her, tie her up, turn her against the fence and hold her there, good head position. Yeah. And the Ketlin's a little bit reckless at times, like rushing in. I can see her even getting a cu- uh, catching her with like a high kick, head kick yeah. or something like that. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I do think it's um, Holly's fight to lose. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think Holly by decision. Yeah. I'd be surprised if she's able to stop her on the ground or on the feet, but at I could see her completely nullifying her all the way through the fight. I really can. Yeah, same. We've got a week off next week, haven't we? I think so. Because the... the pay-per-view, next pay-per-view is Izzy, sorry, Tashira Prahashka. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm starting my playlist on that in the next couple of days. Get that, oh, right, get that breakdown, breakdown ready. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, sorry. It's um, We don't have a break. Oh, no, we do. Sorry. The next fight, the next card back is um, Volkov Rosenstrike. Okay. And that's on June the 4th. Right. And then yeah. the pay-per-views after that. And then that. the pay-per-view to Shira Prohaska. And then there's not a break. Oh, there's a break after Qatar, Emma, and then Adesanya, Kananir. Jeez. In July. The year just rolls through if you try and keep up with the UFC, yeah, yeah. doesn't it? There's a few yeah. more breaks this time of year, though, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they've got International Fight Week coming up soon, aren't they? Start of July. We've yeah, that'll the, be... the IMF tournament going on the same weekend. Yeah. Yeah. 
Should be a good one. Should be a good yeah, one. Yeah, it is, it is a good card this week. Like, despite there's only, like, a, not as many fights on, but there's some really good fights, like, in the prelims, like Martinez, Morales. For sure. So what's your pick? What's your fight of the night pick? Ooh, I think that one. You reckon, I think yeah. Martinez, uh, Vince Morales, yeah. So, okay. So then if that's the fight of the night between Martinez and Morales, who gets performance of the night? Chidi and Giacchani. Rim yeah. I think so too. I think Ed Giacchani is going to get a, another fantastic stoppage. Yeah. I, I like Todorovic, but he's, there's just holes in his game, mm-hmm. in his striking game that someone like Ed Giacchani is going to, he's going to have seen it already. He'll probably know what he's going to try and hit him with now, just like he did against Barrio. He's like, okay, when he does this, his hit goes in this direction. I'm going to catch him with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, quick shout out to our sponsors before we leave you today. Um, Xbrain, xbrain.co.uk. Go and check them out. Um, if you use the code Outlaw, you'll get twenty percent off everything on their site, and they've got all kinds of good stuff. This, this is stashed here, ready for, ready for my workout later. This is my favorite pre-workout right now, the Neuroptimax. So Neuroptimax Sports, and you've you've also got Neuroptimax Pro, which is the powdered one. They're both amazing. They really are, really are fantastic. Best pre-workout I've ever used. Um, you can get that from X-Brain. You can get all of X-Brain's products. You can get all of Onnit's products as well. So if you want Alpha Brain or um, New Mood or whatever else from, from Onnit, get it from X-Brain, then it will save you the whole shipping from the US, etc. And you'll get your 20% off with the code OUTLAW. And our friends at Canacarts. I've had this all, all, all the whole show around my neck and I've not had a little bit of a... Yeah, it's super nice, really smooth. It's the nicest vape I've ever had. It is, isn't it? Yeah. It's lovely. This is um, Skittles, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's fantastic. Really, really good stuff. Anyway, canacarts.uk. Give them a follow on Instagram. Um, check out their website and you will get £5 off your order if you use the code OUTLAWCBD. Um, definitely worth checking out. I mean, as far as vape pens go, I've never had one that tastes as nice or pulls as smooth as this one. Yeah. And they're cool, cool people. So go and give them some support. All right. I think that's everything, isn't it, Jamie? Bit of a shorter yeah. one today. Yeah, yeah. All right. Catch you next time. Nice one. Take care.